Hello YouTube. Today I want to explain to you why you shouldn't take advice from genetic freaks using a video I recently got recommended as an example. I want to make clear that my goal is not to attack the individual that made the video because I have nothing against that person, but since it perfectly encapsulates everything wrong with the type of advice that people who have very good genetics tend to give, I had to use it as my example simply because this is the type of information that might prevent someone like you who doesn't have good genetics from growing. It's going to be in two parts. One, I'm going to offer a critique of said video by the person whose name is Joel Williams. And then in a second part, I'm going to explain to you the reason why the advice happens to be bad and what you can do as someone who might be new to the gym to make sure that you don't follow advice from people who don't necessarily know what they're talking about. So as I said, we're going to start with the video itself. And for some reason, maybe it's a sixth sense. The second I clicked on the video, I could tell that it was going to be full of bad advice, but I was surprised because if before watching it, I could have made a list of the top worst advice to give someone who wants to grow, I think I would have come up with that exact video. So the title is how to get huge arms and in it, this person that we're going to call Joel for the rest of the video, à la française, makes a list of all of the things that he believes to be important to grow your arms. So when we talk about the arms, we talk about the muscles of the biceps and the triceps with the forearms also being important. He opens the video by saying that arms aren't very difficult to grow. And you will see that this statement is going to become very relevant later on because it influences the type of, of advice that he gives. So the first advice is, and I shit you not, that if you want bigger arms, you have to focus on compounds. Tip number one for growing your arms is to focus on your compound lifts. Now, if you don't know, 70% of your arm gains are gonna come from your big compound lifts, like your rows and your bench press. The majority of your arm size gain does not actually come from your shit, like your bicep, push, your, your bicep curls, your tricep push downs, your preacher curls, no. If you spent any amount of time on YouTube Fitness, you've heard that advice in the past, and most likely at this point, you know that this is horrible advice. But Joel doesn't seem to be aware that he is just entering in a long tradition of shitty arm hypertrophy advice. So he tells his audience that since 70% of your arm gains come from compounds, that then compounds are the most important component of arm growth for bodybuilding. First off, that number is literally pulled out of his ass. Why would 70% of your arm gains come from compounds that make no sense whatsoever? The only way that would be true is if you really only did compounds in your program, in which case, of course, most of the gains will come from compounds because it's the only thing that you do. If I take a man and I have him do only bench and overhead press, 100% of his triceps gains will come from bench and overhead press. Does this mean that bench and overhead press is the best movement for hypertrophy for the tricep? No, it's just that if it's the only thing you do, of course, it's the only thing that makes you grow. So this is not a good argument, but we'll see that since the people who follow the type of advice end up doing only compound, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I'm going to explain to you why, because it is very easy to prove that compound movements are not that good for arm growth. But before we get into it, I want to point out something that surprised me in Joel's video, which is the fact that to illustrate his propos, his argument, he includes excerpts that he found on the internet, and the excerpt that he includes go against his points. There are arguments against his points. So he included a text, for example, that clearly states that focusing on compound movements is detrimental for arm growth, and that you should only be doing it if you don't care about getting bigger arms. But the title of the video is how to get huge arms. So why did you include articles from the internet, from sources that clearly stipulate that this is advice strictly for people who do not want to grow their arms? The, the arguments that he produces using these excerpts point to telling his audience that if you want bigger arms, you really should be focusing on things that are not isolation movements and treat them as a priority because things like the curls and the triceps pushdowns, apparently according to what he says, don't really add size to your arms. They only help to create definition and striations. Those are what's essentially, they'll give you some size, of course, right? But those are essentially what's detailing your arm, creating striations and conditioning, you know, the shape of your arm, right? And naturally, this is also total bullshit. 
definitions and striations is defined by how lean you are. It has absolutely nothing to do with the type of movement that you do. This is complete bro science and it has, it has been debunked a long ass time ago. There is no such thing as a lift that is only good at toning your arms or your muscles. Every single resistance training exercise grows your muscles. Then if you want to have striations, you diet down. It is as simple as that. So the fact that the guy is just apparently still falling for that same bro science myth that has been relevant 30 years ago, but that we now know is completely outdated is extremely concerning. But the stupidity of the advice doesn't stop there. Joel also goes on to claim that the reason why compounds are so good for arm growth is because they allow you to use 100% of your arm strength. Getting your compounds up is the number one way to get your arms bigger because that's what they're going to respond the most to, right? You're using 100% of your arm strength in your compound lifts. Translation, because you can lift more weight on compounds, then by definition, they are better than isolation movements. This is also a mindset that is extremely prevalent with people who think that the more weight you can lift on any given lift, the more gains you will get for the entirety of the muscles of the body. That we also know is not true at all for the simple reason that every single muscle group and every single movement pattern rather is going to target certain muscle groups in particular. So even though a compound movement will allow you to lift more weight, it is dispatched throughout several muscle groups and several joints. It's the reason why you're stronger on compounds because more levers are able to apply strength and push the weight. It does not mean that they're better at producing hypertrophy. This is not how it works. If I were to tell you, for example, to pick between a bench press or a tricep pushdown for a lift that is going to maximally challenge the tricep, which one would you pick? If you're not completely brainwashed by powerlifting dogma, you will tell me a tricep pushdown because with a tricep pushdown, the only movement and the only muscle rather that is active is the tricep. This is why isolation movements are strictly superior than compound movements at growing specific muscles of the arms and the body. They're not better at growing overall, but if we're talking about the arm, which is a muscle group with small muscle groups with their own function each, it is always going to be better because you can target the muscle and the muscle only. Nothing else is going to interfere. When you put 100 pounds on your bench press, which is great progress, that's not 100 pounds of gains on your triceps. That's 100 pounds dispatched throughout your chest, shoulders, and the triceps. But if you take a tricep push down and you put 30 pounds on that, you know it's 30 pounds for triceps. It's 100% tricep gains. Because let's admit that being able to put more weight on the bench somehow makes it superior. We then have to observe what muscles are going to be the most influential in your strength going up. And if you are like 99% of people, these muscles are going to be the chest and the shoulders. Very few people are tricep dominant on the bench press. So since the leverage always favors the chest and the shoulder development, these are the muscles that will blow up from the bench press and the amount of strength you will gain from that very same bench press will have very little carryover to your tricep size. Whereas 100% of people that are getting stronger at the pushdown are also getting bigger triceps because everyone can recruit their tricep on the tricep isolation exercise. It's sort of the point. This is why isolation was created to make sure that you could target the specific muscle and not leave it up to chance. Sure, some people get monster triceps doing only bench press. These people are outliers. If you want a method that works for the biggest amount of people, you pick isolation movements. And this is true for pretty much every single compound movement that people tell you will blow up your arms. We know now that for the most part, this is only true for people who are genetic freaks. You take, for example, the chin up. How many of you heard, oh, get to a full plate chin up for reps, you'll have big biceps. One, not even true. Some people get to that and their biceps are puny. And two, why the fuck would you need to get that strong on a compound when you could just get slightly stronger on an isolation? You could get half of that strength progression on a curl and see better results for the simple reason that a chin-up is first and foremost a back movement. It is 
a good movement for the hypertrophy of the lats, but it's horrible for bicep hypertrophy because the primary mover is always going to be the back. And so as you progress, that is what is going to grow. And the same goes for a lat pull down. I don't give a fuck what grip you use. Some grips, if they're supinated, might recruit more bicep, but no amount of tweak is going to turn you into a bicep exercise. Unless you keep the shoulder joint stationary and the only thing that moves is the elbow, in which case, congratulations, you are doing an isolation movement because now the only joint that is moving is the one that activates the bicep. You see how the logic works? You take a compound, you strip it, you strip it from activating certain tendons and certain joints, some muscles now magically remain dormant, and only one is being impacted. And suddenly, that muscle group is the one that blows up on the movement. This is not rocket science, we've known that for a very long time, and this is why isolation movements tend to be better for developing your arms. And this links back to a primary misunderstanding that I noticed in Joel's video, because at the start, he compares arms and shoulders by saying that they are essentially the same, that they work the same. And you'll notice um, your arms are a lot like your shoulders and how they grow. But that's not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. Actually, shoulders and arms are good examples of muscles that should be trained differently because they're not built the same. Their functions are not the same. If I met someone who told me that they believe that you can get 70 to 80% of your shoulder gains from presses, horizontal and vertical, I would agree, because this aligns with the function of the shoulders. So, sticking mostly to compound movements for that muscle group makes sense. Of course, it's not optimal. You still want your elevations. You still want to target the real dart in particular so that you can get to 100%. But between someone who only does lateral raises and someone who only does presses, the guy who only does presses is going to have the biggest shoulder across the board. Because since the muscle of the shoulder is mostly comprised of the front and lateral delt, which both respond very well to presses, this makes a ton more sense. This is the internal mechanism specific to the muscle group. But if we look at the arms, that's not the case at all. Most of the time, the function of the bicep and tricep tend to align and get challenged best by movements who work entirely in isolation. Of course, your triceps are going to be recruited on a press. Of course, the bicep is going to be recruited on a pull, but it's not their main function. So oftentimes, they take a secondary role in these movements and their growth is limited. This is only logical, which also means that shoulders and bicep triceps should be trained differently because they are not the same muscle groups. Their internal mechanisms are entirely different. And once again, what confused me is that Joel sort of seems to get that because in the video, he also recommends people to modify their grip on certain exercises. So close grip bench press for more triceps or supinated lat pull down for more biceps, which in both cases is simply aligning whatever movement pattern you're doing with the function of the muscle to make sure you recruit more. So essentially the guy is one step away from rediscovering isolation movements. And this confusion that permeates the video continues because Joel also goes on to say that arm exercises are optimal for arm development, but in the advice he gives, that's not the message that you get at all. And I think the reason for that is because in his head, arm exercises are accessory. They're just an accessory to your compound movements. And I and other bodybuilders on this platform have insisted for a long time that this mindset is dangerous. Because if you have this mindset, you're going to prioritize compound movements, Compound movements would prioritize big movers, such as the chest, the shoulders, and so you're going to end up with a big imbalance between your shoulders, your chest, your torso, and your arms. Joel, and we'll get back to that, might not know that because he seems to be gifted. His arms, as he says himself, is his strongest point. So his arms grow from pretty much whatever, which is why he also says that it's very easy to grow arms. Um, it's not very difficult to grow. Of course. If you're the type of person who can just do bench press with a close grip or lat pull down with a supinated grip and get massive biceps and triceps, it's very easy for you because you barely have to do anything. But the majority of people are not like this. Now, I want to make clear that this is not me telling you that compound movements should be banished, not at all. They are essential for bodybuilding and they should make up the bulk of your program. But it's the focus that you give them and the emphasis that poses a big issue. Because when you program, 
If you program a bench press, for example, and you think, oh, that's for triceps, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. That's not a tricep exercise. It's tricep volume and tricep fatigue that has to be taken into account if and only if there are other tricep isolation movements in the program to make sure that you're able to progress on these. Because if you hyper-focus on the compounds and you don't have these notions in mind, what will happen is that since they're so fatiguing because they recruit so many muscle groups at once, you will have no energy left for isolation, so no direct volume for these muscle groups, and then you'll end up all imbalanced and you'll wonder what hits you. Well, what hits you is that you most likely followed bad advice. Now, I want to make clear that all of the video that Joel made isn't terrible. He also seems to recommend certain things that we know works. So for example, experimenting with higher volume or throwing in an arm day. These are great advices. Why? Because higher volume on isolation is very easy to handle and it's direct growth for the arms. Likewise, what is an arm day? An arm day is a few compound movements and then a focus on the arm. So that is good advice if you don't take into account what he just told you to do previously, which is to focus on the compounds. But what bothers me with the video and why I'm not super vitriolic is because the information that he shares seems to come from someone who's green. He seems to be discovering things that are pretty evident. For example, that you're supposed to use heavy weights to grow even on arms. I was doing hammer curls very light and then I looked at, like I looked at research and apparently they respond better to heavier training. So when I went and switched my training to just going as heavy as I could, not as heavy, like ego lifting, was trying to go up and weight as, as much as I could and like really focus on getting stronger in hammer curls. One, my other bicep exercise, like my bicep curl jumped. It went from like 30 to 60 pounds in a year. My brachial radi radialis grew in size. That's like, that's a rookie mistake 101. We all start with baby weight on the isolation stuff because we think that the only thing that we need to push is the compounds. Then one day you realize that this is bullshit, you progressively overload on your arm isolation, and suddenly you blow up because surprise, surprise, yes, you also have to get stronger on isolation to get bigger. And this tends to make the rest of his advice highly suspicious because if you've only discovered that recently, how can I trust you to give me good and sound advice afterwards? And worse than that, how can I trust you to give advice to beginners since in terms of experience, at least not in terms of physique, he himself is a beginner. And this shows by the fact that he also doesn't quite apply this methodology of heavy weight to everything. So he seems to believe that you should go heavy on some exercises, but not some of them. There are some exercises where you can go heavy like this, but the majority of your exercises for arms should be in the 8 to 12, specifically 10 reps. These young aesthetic dudes, they tend to hyper-focus on, oh, three sets of 10, oh, three sets of 15, and this is the rep range. A rep range is not that. A rep range is not a magical number you hit that makes you grow. A rep range is simply a structure. It's a structure you put in place to make sure you get close to failure and that you progress. It's a bracket and you progress within the brackets. But if you don't lift at a high intensity, I do not care what the bracket is, you are going to plateau forever because as I said, muscles need to get stronger to grow and the arms aren't a unicorn. I know some people treat their arms as if it was a different entity altogether. And I explained that in terms of biomechanics, it makes sense. You have to understand the, princi the principal function of the bicep and the tricep to be able to target it directly. But it's not rocket science. You know, you don't have to read books for that. You just have to pay attention. Outside of that, in terms of intensity, in terms of progression, the arms are just like the rest of your body. And my issue, and when I saw that, my eyes rolled all the way the fuck back into my skull, when I saw that Joel was promoting the pump, I am dead tired of natural influencers, because I believe the guy is natural, who promote the pump when we know now that the pump is at best an accessory to hypertrophy. Specifically for your arms, I don't think taking a long rest period is beneficial, right? Your arms are a muscle that responds very well to accumulating as much blood and lactic acid buildup in them as possible, right? So you feel them and they're sore. And the issue is that the myth of the pump is directly detrimental to the audience because if you do what Joel tells you to do, which is to just send blood into the arm, what are you going to do? You're going to end up picking very high rep ranges without looking at failure or the weight because you'll just think, oh, I just need to chase the pump. And the best way to chase the pump is just to move. The weight you use is irrelevant for the pump. It's all about the sensation. And that leads to then recommendations that are horrible for hypertrophy. So Joel tells people, for example, that taking short rest periods 
is good because since the arms are different than the rest of the body, you don't have to care about performance. Who cares if you're too fatigued to actually hit a relevant weight? It doesn't matter because if you have very short rest intervals, you get better pumps and so you get better growth. That is, of course, horrible advice. Do not do that. Take your two to three minutes in between arm exercises for the same muscle group. You can superset, but when it comes to performance, performance is just as important for the bicep as it is for the quads. And this is also true because it then leads to progressive overload. Progressive overload is key as I just explained, but if you don't keep an eye on performance or worse, refuse to perform to get a better pump, you're never going to get bigger arms. If you're the dude who is stuck curling the 30s for a year, I do not care how good your pumps are, you won't grow. Your arms will get bigger in the gym, sure, from the blood, but then you go home and you have nothing to show for it. Bodybuilding is not blood bending. It's not the action of seeing how much blood you can push into the muscle. It's the act of building muscle fiber, of making sure the muscle fiber grow. And the only way to do that is to challenge them. The pump is not challenging. It challenges you because the sensation feels nice, but the muscle doesn't have to adapt to the pump. It has to adapt to heightened tension. And once again, Joel seems to know that because right after giving that horrible advice, he nuances the point by adding that you should get stronger. It's kind of a bang them out type muscle, get as much blood into them as possible. You don't have to worry too much about weight, you know, you do want to progress, but the main objective, it should be getting in there intelligently lifting at a nice tempo and getting as much blood into your arms as possible, right? So... But here's the issue. If you give completely contradicting information to people, information that then makes impossible whatever you're going to add afterwards, you're giving bad advice. It is possible to get a good pump if you also focus on strength, but it's simply going to be a byproduct. It should never be the thing that you focus on. And in the same vein, if you tell people, as he does, to use intensity techniques for their arms, that's well and good, but don't tell them to do that in the context of the pump. Like drop sets, cluster sets, even doing those really high rep sets of like 30, or you know, you have someone with you, right? And you're curling the barbell as much as you can, just the empty barbell to 45 pounds. When he tells people that you should do drop sets or you should do cluster sets, to get a better pump, what does he create? He creates people that are going to use baby weight or worse, just the bar and do 50 reps. That'll get you a great pump. It will also get you no results whatsoever. So now once again, we have a principle, the intensity technique that is sound for hypertrophy that is bastardized by bad advice. If you want to use these techniques, that is good but always do it within the context of quality volume, always with relevant rep ranges, relevant weight, and relevant rest periods. Do not do it just to get more blood into the muscle. Because if you do, you'll be the type of person who does more burn out sets than they do hard sets, which I see at the gym all the time. People who just pump themselves out these people, I can guarantee you, in a year will be the exact same size because they're not challenging the muscle. And remember at the start, when I told you that this video felt like a caricature of the worst possible arm growth advice? Well, I didn't lie because after the pump comes one thing that I thought I would never hear again because it's such stupid advice that at this point, I think that anyone with a brain would be able to tell that this is nonsense. But in the same breath, after telling people that they should focus on sending blood into the muscle to grow, Joel tells them that if they want bigger forearms, the only thing they have to do is simply do all of their back work without straps. A forearm swing and a little bit of bicep is to do strapless back training. Now, when you hit your back naturally, you do hit your forearms a lot. But a lot of people tend to uh, put straps on it. And because of this, their forearms doesn't get the same activation as it usually would, right? And then you have to take extra time just to hit your forearms directly. Now, when I heard that, I admit, I thought I was getting trolled. I thought, oh shit, you spent all of your time writing a script for a troll video. The guy is, is just making a joke. It's a big joke. At the end of the video, he will reveal that all of that was just an elaborate prank on people and that all of the advice he gave was the worst possible advice and you should do the exact opposite. I was hoping he was going to say that. But of course, I was disappointed. He was dead fucking serious. So his big suggestion for bigger forearms is... Just grab all of your back work, don't use straps, and this will massively blow up your forearms. Well, if it were that easy, we would all have massive forearms. Because pretty much everyone deadlifts with a mixed grip, pretty much everyone does rows, and very few people use straps. And yet you see stick forearms as far as the eye can see. 
So this points to one thing and one thing only, and that is that the advice he gives, you should actually flip on its head. Because the reason why people have small forearms isn't because they use straps. Actually, it's the exact opposite. People have small forearms because they don't use straps. This makes no sense. Well, actually, it makes a shit ton of sense. If you don't use straps, you are going to tire out your grip all the time. Meaning that when it's time to use your grip to recruit the function of the forearm, which is not just to do this, you have no juice left. So you never train your forearm because you don't have enough energy left. So the forearm never grows. But it goes deeper than that. Let's say we did this and we sacrificed forearm isolation for back work, for pull work. All right, that could actually work if and only if that function of the forearm was actually relevant for hypertrophy. But sadly, it isn't. And I'm not saying that when you grab onto something, your forearms are not impacted. Of course, they are. But minimally, for the simple reason that this function of the forearm is always secondary to whatever function you're training on back work. When you do a roll, for example, or a high pull, the function of the human body you're training is first and foremost the function of the muscle that moves the weight, not the function of the muscle that just holds onto the weight. That is the logic of the main mover and the secondary mover. And so regardless of how strong you get on the back exercise, the forearm will always be a secondary mover in it, meaning that the gains you'll get in terms of hypertrophy will always be minimal. It's the same example I gave previously with the bench press. What do you think is going to get you bigger forearm gains? Getting really strong at rows or getting really strong at hammer curls, which is a lift that recruits the main function of the forearm and of the forearm only. Well, if we follow the logic of countdown versus isolation movement, you understand that in terms of pure form hypertrophy, an isolation movement for the forearm is always going to be superior. But that's not the worst part, because there's, there's actually a double whammy. When people tell you to just go strapless for your back work and your forearms will get big, not only will you not get big forearms, but your back is also going to stay small and weak for a very simple reason. You're now letting one of the smallest and weakest muscles of the human body limit the development and growth of one of the biggest and strongest muscles of the human body. You're letting this puny thing limit the growth of whatever is back there that is massive slabs of meat that are designed to move a shit ton of weight. Straps allow you to bypass this weakness of the grip because anyone who has decent levels of strength know that at some point you can start to roll much more than you can grip. So now, by following this advice, you effectively sabotage the growth of two muscle groups. And the only benefit you gained is that you saved some time on form isolation. Now, let me ask you one thing. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to save 10 to 15 minutes a week on form movements that are not fatiguing at all and are actually very fun, while at the same time having to sandbag on your back movements because your grip gives up the second you try to use weight that is actually challenging? I know that if you watch this channel, you're already aware of everything that I'm telling you right now, but understand that there are people who are not. And these people are likely to fall for that advice because it sounds good. We're gonna save time and get big by doing compounds and no straps and the pump. They have no idea about what works and what doesn't. And this is why I wanted to make this video because did I just make this video to dunk on an up and coming YouTuber who just so happens to give bad information? Did I just make this video because I'm actually jealous of the guy and it's an excuse to attack him because he has a better physique, he looks better or he happens to be more handsome? All of that could be true. But I'm not that pathetic and I don't usually go out of my way to just gratuitously tackle people that have done nothing to me. Actually, I made this video to prove a point. The person that made the video is not super important to me. What they represent does. Because in the case of Joel, we have the perfect example of someone who has extremely good genetics and who, because of these good genetics, gives bad advice. Not because they're stupid, not because they're evil, but because they have no idea about what works and what doesn't work for normal people. For the simple reason that everything works for them. So how would they know? As an influencer, this is the best we can do. We can look at our experience or anecdotal evidence or maybe studies and we can surmise all of that 
and see what we can give to the audience in terms of practical advice. But if everything you've ever attempted worked like this and you grew up and exploded in size by doing whatever, how exactly are you to differentiate between things that actually work and things that don't work? I'm going to say something that might blow your mind, but the physique that you see and the videos that I implemented into my segment was built in three years. Joel's physique that you see with these massive arms, beautiful sweep, good shoulders, was built in three years. This means that in three years, by following sub-portraining methods, the guy got better results than 99% of all natural bodybuilders. And yes, I say natural because I firmly believe that Joel is natural. I buy it. I think that this is the case of someone who has God-given genetics. He has just incredible potential for muscle building to the point that no amount of work you will put in will allow you to look like him. If you look at his muscle insertions, his arms look fucking insane. I mean, I don't know the measurement and it doesn't fucking matter because that's not what bodybuilding is about. What matters is the sweeps, the 3D effect. Look at the connection of the tricep and the shoulder. It, he looks photoshopped in real life. That pair of arms would already be incredible on someone who's been training for 15 years. And he trained one fifth of that. You can't teach that. That is given by God. But he might not be aware of that. He might not realize how good his genetics are because we have a natural tendency as humans to claim everything positive that happens to us as a resultant of our efforts. And we also naturally have the opposite reaction of pushing away the blame and claiming that anything that happens that is bad to us is the universe or it's unfair or it's outside of our control. All of this is very well known. It's psychological biases. You can see it in the behavior of pretty much every single human being on the internet or outside of the internet. But where it becomes relevant is the impact on the influencer himself. Because now we have someone who clearly got results very quickly from methods that are not that good, but in his head, that's not the case. In his head, he looks the way he does because of his hard work. And so, by sharing the advice with you, he truly believes that he's doing you a favor. And let me clarify by saying that I'm not claiming by this that Joel is stupid or delusional. He is just human. As influencers, as human, we can simply give advice from our own perspective. And Joel's perspective is one of someone who has 10 out of 10 genetics for muscle building, and so who is unable to really assess whether or not the information he shares with you is relevant or not. Now, here's the issue. You're not him. By definition, genetic freaks are a super minority. So we can say that they must make up around 0.2% of the population, but that's that. And that's not many people. You might have run into someone who has good genetics, who has 8 out of 10 genetics, 9 out of 10 genetics. Well, the chances of you having ever run into a true genetic freak, a 10 out of 10, is very, very low. And for the sake of the argument, here is how I define a genetic freak. In the domain of bodybuilding, a genetic freak is someone who either looks incredible without having ever touched a weight, meaning that they don't even train and they mug people who do, or it's people who explode in size extremely quickly by either training completely randomly or doing almost nothing. And to anchor that definition in reality, let me share with you my meeting with one such individual. A story I said uh, on the channel in the past, but one that I love to share because to this day it still blows my mind and it'll give you a good example of what I mean when I say genetic freak. So, when I was in college, in grad school, I was living with a roommate who was from Nigeria and we both went to the same gym. Now, here is what this guy would do. This is the way he would train. He had an app on his phone that was a randomizer. So every time he would set foot into the gym, he would click on the app and the app would give him random exercises, random rep ranges and random sets. And this is what he would do. He would do that for 40 minutes twice a week. Again, no rep range, no progressive overload. He didn't even look at the weight. He would grab random weights. He also hated the cold, but we lived in a very cold place and it was winter eight months out of the year. 
he refused to train when it was below zero, meaning he only trained four months out of the year. Four months out of the year, no progressive overload, 40 minutes twice a week. He also did not follow a diet. He f just ate whatever his mom used to cook for him. It was fatty fish, it was chips, ton of shitty carbs, tons and tons of junk food. So if you take all of that and you compound it and you make a random average person do this, this person would look like shit, they would look like they don't even lift, they would even look worse than the average person. This guy looked like a Greek god. He had 3D delts, he had a perfect six pack, he had massive sweeping quads, he did not train legs. I didn't mention that, I forgot. He did not train legs. He had better legs than 99% of people who do squats. He had a perfect squatted back, massive traps, massive biceps. You name it. The dude was 6 feet at 185, 8% body fat. He had a physique that most people will never attain in their entire life, or if they do, it will take them 10 years of hardcore effort. He got all of that by essentially doing nothing. Now, imagine if this guy tomorrow decided to start a YouTube channel. What type of advice do you think he would give? Do you think he would give good advice? And I think that Joel is in the same category. He's someone who is incredibly gifted, who is very young and who has very little experience, for whom everything works, and so he is bound to just repeat whatever worked for him, even if for the average person, that is going to be horrible advice. Because, and this is why I insisted on the genetic freak and the 0.2%, it is super important that you understand that you, my friend, are most likely comprised within the 99% that remains. You are most likely someone who has average or slightly good genetics, but you're nowhere near that guy. Here's how I would rank genetics if I were to give a rank from 1 to 10. Someone like Joel, someone like my roommate, these people are 10s, okay? They're super rare. Then you have people like Alex Leonidas. I think Alex would be a 5.5 or a 6.5, okay? Slightly above average, maybe a 7, maybe if we're generous. Someone like GVS is in the same boat. I know that some people think that GVS is this monster genetic freak. He's not, okay? I've met freaks. He's not a freak. He has good insertions, he has good responses to hypertrophy, but he's like a 6 or a 7. This is important that you keep it in mind, because the difference between a 7 and a 10 is like the difference between heaven and earth. If you play chess, to give you a good example of what I'm talking about, a 7 would be an international master. This person is very strong at chess, they would kick your ass. But if you pair them against a GM, they would get shattered, they would get destroyed. A GM and an IM is a completely different species, and a 7 and a 10 is the exact same thing. And then you have people who are simply average, like myself. If I were to grade myself in terms of genetics for muscle building, I would give myself a 5. A 5 is someone who is going to look good after years and years of effort. But compared to a 10, Joel achieved in 3 years what I achieved in 15, and you could even make the point and the case that he looks better than I do. I wouldn't take offense to that at all, because I know where I stand, but I also know that there are direct implications to this. If you take a 5, a 5 is someone who struggled. If you find a 5 was a good physique that you think looks good or even not natural, that guy knows a shit ton, because the amount of, of experience he had to accumulate, the amount of deviations he had to figure out to keep growing amounts to a shit ton. And the same goes for a 7 or a 6. You still have to put in the work if you're a 7. A 7 means that you have potential, but it's dormant and you have to actually find methods that are going to work for you. So, you can take advice from a 7. A 7 will give you solid, solid training methods. But a 10 won't. A 10 lacks the ability to do that. Because paradoxically, people who are the most talented in the domain where they excel tend to make horrible teachers, because everything comes naturally to them. And I have another great example from my college years and my college days. I used to have a stat teacher, it was like a 700 class, who was a complete genius. The dude was from Korea, he was poached, poached by my university, and he was the horrible teacher because everything came naturally to him. The guy had published multiple papers that revolutionized the field, he won multiple prizes, he was incapable of teaching because he would write things on the board and look at us like, you get it, right? I can move on, right? And everyone in the class was like, no, what? 
That's not how you teach. Just because you get it with your genius brain does not mean that we do. Same for people in bodybuilding who are freaks. Their bodies get it. Like this. Your body will struggle to understand things that they understand intuitively that they grow from magically almost. Which doesn't mean that they don't have to struggle. Of course, Joel still had to struggle. He still had to put in the work. But the issue is that he most likely never really had to intellectualize it too much because his natural talent and his natural instinct was enough he could get by with just that. To get back to the example of chess, if you know who Mikhail Tal is, he was one of the greatest attackers in the history of chess. He would checkmate people left and right, he would sacrifice pieces, he was a monster on the board. People feared him because fighting him meant that you were going to put, be put in positions that were highly stressful because the guy would sacrifice his queen and you'd be like, you couldn't even take the queen because you'd think, shit, if he sacrificed the queen, it's because he saw something on the board. I'm about to get checkmated. But most times it wasn't the case because Michael Tal was famous for not calculating. He would not look at the actual outcome of his moves. He just felt it. He felt a position. He attacked on instinct. You can't teach that. If I tell you, hey, like checkmate me in five moves on instinct, you're going to look like a complete noob. I'm going to defend, I'm going to move my king and I'm going to win. He managed to beat the best players on the planet without actually calculating a single move. Meaning also that he would have made a horrible teacher because he would not be able to actually transfer that knowledge onto someone else. Because you cannot teach instinct. Instinct is the opposite of knowledge. Knowledge is culture. It's something that humans can share with one another. But paradoxically, instinct and great talent also tends to give people a ton of visibility because we all look up to these types. We all look up to the geniuses and we all look up to the freak. And this is how you end up with a bunch of young men on Instagram or YouTube who give horrible advice, but who have shit tons of visibility. It's because in bodybuilding, at least, we tend to look at the ones that are the biggest and the freakiest and we think, okay, this person must know what they're talking about, look at their physique. But here's the issue. This person might be a 10 and you're a 5. Now what happens when 5s start taking advice from a 10? Well, I'll tell you what happens. You get shit results. Because whatever they did that worked for them will not work for you. It's going to flop times and times again. This is like this ugly dude who's trying to take advice, like seduction advice, from a stud from a guy who's six feet six, built with blue eyes and who women love. You think it's gonna work out? The reason why his methods work is because he's the one using them. They only function for him because women are willing to overlook the stupidity of the attempt for the guy. If you're a five and you're average looking and you try the same methods, the only thing you'll catch is a restraining order. You will not be successful with women. You will have to come out with strategies that are best aligned with your gift, with your cards, with what you can work with. And this is why I said that this video is not an attack on Joel. It's not an attack on people who have good genetics. Because you know what? Good for them. But just make sure that you don't end up being the five who takes advice from the ten. Because it's simply going to depress you. It's going to make you think that you do not have potential. When in reality, you do. You can grow from other methods that work for the majority of the population because that's what you are. There is nothing wrong with being average. I am Mr. Average and I still got to a high level in multiple disciplines simply by working hard and by following the right methods. And I wanted to make that clear because I did not make this video to make fun of Joel or to attack him or to encourage people to harass him or call him stupid. None of that. I made this video to give you the weapons to shift and to actually sift rather between advice that is applicable to you and advice that simply isn't. So please do not go on his channel to insult him. Do not harass the guy. He did nothing wrong. If you end up visiting Joel Williams channel, please leave a nice comment and leave a like. At the end of the day, this is a member of the natural community. He is one of our brothers and he is sharing his passion on the internet like the rest of us. 
So regardless of the quality of his advice or what I believe his genetics might be, he deserves nothing but our support and our kindness for having the courage to put himself out there. This is something that I say because I know a lot of you guys are going to be jealous because the guy looks like a Greek god and he has better genetics than you and you're going to be envious and you're going to use this video as an excuse to act like a complete shithead. Well, let me tell you one thing. No man is more pathetic than the one who is envious and take out his anger on people with better genetics. Because at the end of the day, you get what you get. If you refuse to work with what you have because it's not good enough, you're just a spoiled brat. Do not go looking into the plates of other people and complain they have more than you. You have stuff in your plate, work with that. If you behave like this, I do not claim you and go fuck yourself. Because ultimately, as I said, Joel is not evil. He's not doing that on purpose. He is quote unquote a victim of his blessing. But there are some people out there who do that very same thing on purpose. There are those people out there, those influencers, who give bad advice knowing that this is bad advice. And you could tell me, well, why would anyone do that? Why would anyone give bad advice on purpose? Well, the answer is very simple, because it is popular. Because being a contrarian on this platform gets you a lot of attention. So an example I found of this is a guy I came across on IG whose name is not important, who tells his audience that the best way to get big biceps is weighted pull-ups. Now, I won't go into the complete explanation again as to why this is stupid advice, but essentially we know that it is because it's deeply unpractical. Between getting to an elite level strength on pull-ups, which might or might not give you massive biceps, or getting to an intermediate level of strength on curls, which is guaranteed to give you bigger biceps, which one is more realistic for 99% of the population? Well, unless you want to be a contrarian, you know that the answer is the curl, the isolation movement. And I think that this guy, deep down, knows this. But he also knows that by going against the grain and by being illogical on purpose, he's going to attract a lot of attention. Because now he can position himself as this savior, as this guy who reveals the big secret that actually every single influencer with a brain has been telling you to train your biceps directly for bigger biceps, but it's all a lie, it's all a conspiracy. The actual magic formula for big biceps is just doing a movement that doesn't even recruit the bicep as a primary mover, of course. And when I say it like this, naturally you think, well, this is so stupid, how don't people see through it? Well, look at Mike Menzer. Pretty much every single natural influencer or even non-natural on this platform who know what they're talking about will tell you that Menzo's method is bullshit. It doesn't work. It's stupid. It's going to make you regress. But it works for the reasons I just outlined. It's because Menzer was against the grain. He was a contrarian. Everyone else was telling you to do the exact opposite of what he does. And so his method stood out. Now, let me ask you one question. Do you think that his method, HIT, would have become popular if the guy was a twig? Or if the guy wasn't charismatic or cultured or intelligent? No, it was because the method and the advice was coming from someone who looked like a 10 that it became so prevalent. And that is a very hard pill to swallow for everyone on this platform, me included. But on social media, the effectiveness or the soundness of a method matters less than the physique of the person who promotes that method. Meaning that as long as someone looks good, regardless of how stupid their advice is, there will always be people to follow it. And this is why IG in particular is full of young men giving horrible advice that we know is bullshit, but because they go for the men's formula, they get away with it, which then results in a bunch of people who have average genetic getting no results whatsoever because the source of the information is poisoned to start with. And there are too many examples for me to cite them all to tell you, hey, avoid this or avoid that. And I also don't want to do that because I don't want to become a replacement brain for you. So instead, what I want you to do is Observe the attitude of these people, because they always have the same one. It's always a contrarian attitude of, I'm right and everyone else is wrong, which statistically is not possible. Or it's an edgy attitude of saying, oh, everyone does this, but I do this and I get results. Look at how cool and different I am than everyone else. 
These are very childish attitudes that are very, very easy to spot. But also understand that if you're young, they're also attractive because they're cool. It's cool to behave like this. It's cool to behave like an asshole, especially when said asshole has a six pack and you also want a six pack. And I'm happy that I was able to make this video because it offers some needed contrast to what I used to say in the past, which is the fact that preferentially you would want to take advice from people who look like they lived. But that doesn't mean that you can just turn off your brain the second someone with a good physique tells you to do something. You still have to maintain a level of critical thinking, which was entirely absent from Joel Williams' comments. I checked the comment of his video, which got plenty of visibility, and you just see people, very young men, who seem to believe that the advice is 100% good, when I prove to you that actually it's the exact opposite. The video is a caricature. All of the worst arm training advice can be found in this video, which should be for you an eye-opener, because you could very well be one of these people. You could be one of these people who falls for bad advice because you just turn your brain off or because you lacked the ability to understand why the advice you received was bad, based again on logic. A logic which I will reiterate here to make it clear. Sure, there will be some people who will get great results without ever targeting the muscle with isolation. And sometimes, these people will even look better than other lifters who use isolation. But that doesn't mean that we should all stop following these bodybuilding methods that we know work. If anything, the fact that people with good genetics can get away with subpar methods actually means that average people should not follow their advice. It means that these people got their physique despite of their methods, not because of them. Let me remind you that bodybuilding as a method is supposed to allow the greatest number of people to succeed. If a method only works for genetic outliers, it's literally useless because it goes against that very principle. And this is why I'm so attached to bodybuilding as a method, because it can be applied across the board regardless of who you are. It could be applied to someone like me who is a five and was still able to get a good physique. But not everyone works like this. Some people are not on social media to help other people. Some people are only there for their ego or for self-glorification. And these types don't care about the results that their advice produces. All that matters to them is that the advice gets them attention. Whatever happens to you after that is none of their problem. And here's the kicker, these people are there to stay. They'll never go away. Social media always attract that type of individual. So it's your responsibility to protect yourself from the garbage advice that they give. But I think that with all of the logical information I gave you in this video, you have more than enough to protect yourself. So if you learned something from me today, please consider supporting the channel on my coffee page. It's the first link in the description. A $3 a month pledge is already a lot and it allows me to keep treating this YouTube channel as my secondary job. It allows me to keep taking the time to write these scripts and to make these videos for you guys. And I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.